So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very pleased today to have Soren Kopa. Soren is an expert in subfactor theory and many parts of analysis. He originally got his PhD in, uh, with Dan Boakolescu before coming to the United States and has been at UCLA since the 1980s. He's won many awards. I think it sticks out that he got the Ostrowski Prize and was a lecturer at the College de France, as well as the ICM in Madrid. And Soren will tell us today about some analysis aspects of subfactor theory. We're very much looking forward to your talk, Soren. Why don't you share your screen? Thank you very much for the invitation and for the presentation, Arthur. So, let me see. Did I share it? Yes. Okay. Now I need to open it. Okay. Uh, so, um, since the audience is so diverse, let me uh, begin with some uh, uh, definition here. Uh, let me move this. It's been a bit covered by the... Okay. But how do I move this? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so uh, uh, let me uh, begin by some definitions. So um, first of all, what is a two-one factor? That's an infinite dimensional for Neumann algebra. That's a factor. So uh, it, uh, it uh, has trivial center for Neumann algebra, meaning that it's a weakly closed star subalgebra or on some Hilbert space um, and satisfies this uh, finiteness axiom that uh, projections cannot be uh, equivalent uh, in, inside the von Neumann algebra, uh, one uh, with another one that's strictly less than it. So that's what one calls finiteness by analogy with the fact that you cannot have an isomorphism between a finite set and uh, a, a strictly smaller subset. Uh, and if it is also infinite dimensional, then that's what's called the two one factor. If without that infinite dimensionality, uh, of course, a, a, a very uh, obvious example are the n by matrices, uh, the algebra of n by matrices. Uh, so uh, what the weak uh, uh, closeness of uh, the, the closeness of the algebra in uh, the weak operator topology entails is that all the spectral uh, decompositions of uh, Hermitian elements lies in the von Neumann algebra. So you have plenty of projections. They form a nice lattice over intersection and, and supremum. Um, and, uh, you know, together with this um, finiteness axiom, uh, uh, this gives uh, an extremely interesting um, so called geometry of projections, which von Neumann like to call quantum logic, okay? One should remember that. Uh, so uh, the finiteness axiom uh, is, turns out in fact to be equivalent to the existence of a, of a trashial state, uh, uh, of a functional on M that's positive and has the trashiality property, the usual trace property that uh, I call it tau, tau of x, y is equal to tau of y, x for any uh, two elements, x and y in M. And uh, so it does give a, a dimension function on, on, this, uh, on the lattice of projections. By that, I mean that two, uh, two projections will have uh, the same trace if and only if they are equivalent by, as I said before, by partial isometries that have range and source P and respectively Q. Um, and because of the infinite dimensionality, unlike n by matrices, which I said is a, an example of finite factors, these two one factors have the range 
of the dimension function of the projections equal to all zero one. Uh, it's zero one because don't forget we the trace given say we would take matrices it's always taken normalized so for the uh, usual trace on matrices you divide by n if it's n by matrices so that's what's called the continuous dimension phenomenon. Uh, in fact, this is also because any maximal abelian algebra massa uh, in a, such an uh, 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 two one factor is diffused. So has no atoms, implying that um, it's like L infinity of zero one, if you want. Uh, and of course, you can take pure projections that give you this continuous um, dimension phenomenon uh, inside uh, such a massa. Okay. Uh, the trace uh, gives rise to Hilbert spaces, you know, by completion. And so that's what I call L2M. Uh, and L2M, uh, with possible, you know, multiplication from the right by elements in M, typically projections give you actually the list of all left modules, all representations of such a two one factor, uh, which comes for free because what I said before. Uh, with uh, 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 dimension of the Hilbert module, a notion of dimension of the Hilbert module, uh, which is which completely classifies the representation theory. So the all, all these uh, Hilbert modules, left Hilbert modules uh, over a two one factor by this parameter, which goes from zero to infinity. Okay and which is obtained in this way. This is what's called the Mare von Neumann dimension. And um, now you can take n by matrices over M, over a two-one factor. I call it, you know, the amplification of M by N. So that's what this power stands for. Uh, and which is obviously a two-one factor. But what's fun uh, here is that, and in fact quite remarkable, is that you can take T by T matrices over a two one factor for any positive real T. Uh, of course, it, it's pretty obvious how you do it. I explained here. That's called the T amplification of a two one factor. And you have this unbelievable, you know, phenomenology with all the, this, um, uh, the possibility of, uh, you know, amplifying consecutively and so on. This, uh, you know, you will have this relation M to the S to the power T's. So if you take n t by t matrices, s by s matrices over t by t matrices, that's s times t uh, matrices, you know, uh, and and the, the, the fundamental group, uh, this immediately gives rise to this, this question when such an amplification is isomorphic to initial factor and you uh, call the fundamental group uh, of m precisely those t's, the group of, of those t's for which m to the t is isomorphic to m. Now, uh, two one factors, this look very strange object, you know, unlikely object, but actually they arise from lots of geometric objects, such as groups, more generally groupoids, and their action on spaces, including, by that I mean including, you know, uh, groups that act on the Hilbert space, meaning, you know, group representations, in other words. And then followed by geometric, I call them operations like amplifications, tensor product, cross products, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, others that, in fact, I insist that this particular one I listed are what call, I call geometric, uh, as opposed to what I would call random. So when such data is amenable, I, G stands here, not necessarily for a group, it's like a generic geometric object, which can be a group, okay? So I view a group as a, as a geometric object. For instance, if the action of the group, uh, if the acting group is amenable, so if G itself is a group, uh, or it's the group is a group acting on a, on, a, on a probability measure space with the group being amenable, then the resulting factor, uh, which I will denote L of G is amenable and by a very famous theorem of Kohn, then it's isomorphic to the hyperfinite to one factor, uh, which is something I uh, uh, can that can be defined as an infinite tensor product of two by two matrices. This really, you can view it as a non-commutative uh, uh, 
version of the unit interval when the unit interval is viewed, uh, you know, in in the in basis two, so as a dyadic, uh, emphasizing the the dyadic sigma algebra. Uh, so notably, uh, we have that if uh, the if uh, this uh, G is an infinite conjugacy class, I abbreviate that ICC group, then L of G is the group to one factor uh, of G and it's amenable whenever uh, this uh, uh, group is amenable, as I said, by Korn's theorem. And you have this other uh, important construction, the so-called uh, group measure space uh, uh, construction, uh, where you have G now given by uh, the, so the object G is now a uh, 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 group gamma acting on the probability measure space, preserving the measure free ergodic. Uh, more generally, you can take countable equivalence relations, what I call countable groupoid. Uh, and that gives rise to, as I said, you know, this uh, uh, group measure space to one factor. L of G will now be, actually, this is the standard notation. It's L infinity of X um, uh, cross gamma, cross product notation. Uh, this uh, subalgebra will, L infinity of X, will sit then like a diagonal in this uh, two one factor around which everything turns, so to say. So it's like a spine, uh, it's maximal abelian, and the normalizer generates all the algebra. In other words, it's what one calls for a two one factor, a Cartan subalgebra, okay? Because of this feature of, you know, turning everything around it. Oops. Uh, now there is something I would like to separate from this uh, geometric construction, which I call randomness. Uh, uh, so uh, to one factors from uh, randomness uh, uh, initial data from uh, uh, which are uh, obtained as free products of uh, uh, treasure for Neumann algebra. If, if you want, you know, uh, a billion or, or to one factors themselves. Uh, like M0, pre product M1, etc. Uh, more generally, given a threshold for Neumann algebra M0 and a part of it, which let's call it B, okay, for Neumann subalgebra, by that I mean, uh, okay, which one knows to be in some relations with elements in, uh, in another threshold for Neumann algebra. So, in other words, you have also B sitting in another. For Neumann algebra threshold for Neumann algebra N0, then one can combine the two by imposing the random relation between them, the free independent relation by taking what's called the amalgamated free product of threshold for Neumann algebra M0, amalgamated free product over B with N0, which actually you know, in what I will be saying, actually does play a role. Uh, so I, I um, uh, remind you also uh, what symmetries of such objects e are. Uh, so of course, by that I, I, you know, initially, at least, you know, classically, so to say, uh, uh, a symmetry of an algebra will be an automorphism of the algebra, okay? So for that, in that respect, we keep on, you know, this uh, point of view, of course, for two one factors. And they, uh, since they come themselves, you know, from geometric objects, very often, I mean, typically, let's say, uh, automorphism uh, of a two one factor from geometric data will come from geometric symmetries, symmetries of the at the geometric level at the initial of the initial data. For instance, if you take an automorphism of the if if the data is a group, so if M is a group factor L of G, and you take an, an automorphism of the group, that obviously entails an automorphism of the a symmetry of L of G. A natural symmetry comes because of the isomorphisms, uh, the, because of the amplifications, which 
I remind you, means an, uh, an isomorphism between M and an amplification of M, M to the T. So I view this also as, as symmetries of M, which are very typical for a two one factor. Okay, it's an unusual phenomenon, only happening for two one factors. And uh, uh, let me point out that both such symmetries can be encoded as a Hilbert bimodule structure, okay, M Hilbert over M uh, in this manner, I explained here, okay, where of course you will have L to M as a bimodule, but properly amplified and cut off with projections left and right, okay, so uh, I it's self-explanatory. I won't go on into explaining what I wrote here. Uh, now, such Hilbert bimodules actually can be characterized abstractly by the condition that they are, you know, by bimodules. I leave the left side, you know, as a dummy to one factor, kind of unknown, and uh, just impose that the dimension of H of the bimodule, okay, so H is now a bar, left, right bimodule over two and five percent of them, M being the one that's assigned and N like a dummy unknown. Uh, that's by definition, this product of dimension. And these are exactly the symmetries, you know, I said before as automorphism and amplifications are exactly those that give you dimension one. Uh, okay. And, uh, but more generally, one can for one factors, you know, very naturally consider, uh, let's call them virtual lambda symmetry. Lambda stands here for a parameter, okay? Uh, that will be a Hilbert NM by module with this dimension, the Mare von Neumann dimension taken in that manner, uh, equal to lambda minus one and finite. Okay, so this we will call a virtual symmetry, okay? This is the same as considering, in fact, it's uh, uh, observation of con, uh, a subfactor embedding. So M is my subfactor and with another subfactor N uh, embedded into it with the Jones index, which is the dimension of L to M over N from the left, okay, it's also equal to this dimension as a Hilbert by module because the dimension of L2M uh, as a right M module is one uh, equal to lambda minus one and finite. Okay, so that's also something called virtual isomorphism of M uh, with another factor of index lambda minus one or dimension if you prefer. The word virtual, uh, was coined actually kind of uh, recently. It comes from uh, uh, orbit equivalence ergodic theory. I think the term, which I find very nice and good, uh, is due to Alex Furman, uh, the, the word itself, but not in this context. It's for groups and, and the orbit equivalence uh, context, in the orbit equivalence context. And it's sort of self-explanatory. It means, you know, this finite indexness uh, between the two objects are correlated with finite index. Uh, uh, a natural condition, by the way, for virtual symmetry is that they be reducible. So a virtual symmetry from now on will be either a subfactor of finite index or such a Hilbert by module of finite index, okay, which are equivalent. So the study of virtual symmetries or subfactors of, of two one factors was initiated by Vaughan, as you all know, in 81, uh, who answered, in fact, the most, most fundamental question about these subjects by identifying the set of values the parameter lambda minus one can have as being, you know, this famous uh, Jones spectrum, I'll call it, four cosine square of pi over n, uh, when less than four and then the whole half line. So the parameter is quantized, okay? This uh, uh, lambda parameter, which is incredible, okay? Quite frankly, in this framework of, uh, you know, non-commutative spaces, so to say, non-commutative analysis. Uh, so, and actually he also showed that all the values do occur. I mean, it's not like it belongs there, it's a true parameter. Okay, 
and it happens even in the hyperfinite one factor. The next fundamental question, of course, about such virtual symmetries of a given factor. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, symmetries, or if you prefer by that, again, actually I, I repeated here subfactor, but we agreed that it's the same thing, is their classification of the conjugacy of M, of course. I mean, you know, symmetries, you want to classify them. Okay, but first of all, you need to know the two one factors themselves if you want to classify these objects. So there is actually from John's work uh, uh, an invariant that comes by very naturally from you know from his consideration. The John's iterated basic construction, which was the key tool in his proofs, you know. Uh, of the, the, the uh, restrictions on the parameter of the quantization phenomenon for the parameter, uh, uh, that, that gives rise, so the iterating this basic construction, he constructed a, a whole tower of uh, two one factors, I emphasize it here, with a trace, with the sequence of projections that satisfy the famous, you know, Jones relations, also called Temperley Lieb or Temperley Lieb Jones uh, relations because it was found that you know they they appear this uh, uh, in in a particular context in work of Temperley Lieb in statistical mechanics and you know, calculations in the Potts model. Uh, so uh, and well here the relative commitments Jones proved you know through this machinery actually uh, that that it's uh, uh, they are finite dimensional. So you have this system, or out of all this system of inclusions of this, uh, between these high relative commitants, these are finite dimensional system algebras with a trace, with a whole system of inclusions one into the other, and with the Jones projection sitting in a sort of remarkable way, and all, you know, doing lots of properties, okay? You have lots of properties for this, you know, that come from free, for free from this context. So this is what uh, uh, what's usually called the standard invariant. I'll denote it this way, G sub N into M of N into M, okay? So it contains in any case the index, okay? The, you know, lambda minus one, the parameter. And in, an important part of information in, of this is, is contained in the sort of Cayley type uh, weighted pointed by partite graph gamma sub n into m uh, that describes the, the diagrams of the inclusions of the matrices, uh, which is, I'll call it the standard graph. It's also called the principal graph. Standard is an adjective, which is, I can, you know, you can say, you know, give me this graph, is it standard or not? That's why I kind of prefer this term. Uh, and main questions very early, uh, that appeared is whether this invariant, uh, which, well, by the way, this invariant was, of course, it's implicit in, in Kohn's work, was for sure it, it, it comes, you know, in 82, 83 for the first time, very amply in the correspondence between Vaughn and uh, Mihai and me. So it, we kind of, you know, looked at this independently, uh, uh, both he and, and us. Uh, and of course, now we know it took years to understand uh, and bring really bring to life this uh, this object. But several questions were posed right away. Uh, that was, of course, find all lambda minus one uh, uh, values of the index of the parameter larger than four for, for which uh, there exists uh, irreducible subfactors that realize that index, because John's parameter for four on the examples were actually uh, uh, using the fundamental group in a sort of, uh, I mean, actually in a rather explicit way. And the fact that for the hyperfinite one factor, that's all the half line. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it's not, um, uh, well, uh, th th those are not irreducible subfactors. So that's also, uh, is it, if it is possible for GNM to consist of the Jones projections only. In other words, uh, if for any lambda larger than uh, minus one larger than four, whether there exists n into m 
uh, with the, the, this uh, standard invariant equal to G, I'll denote it G lambda because it only depends on the parameter as being generated by projections. For less than four, Jones proved that this is the case, that you find for all the values exactly this, uh, this uh, invariant, okay, this uh, uh, standard invariant, but for larger than four, it wasn't, no. Um, and that's, by the way, equivalent to the fact that the graph is equal to A infinity, which is just, you know, the, the A infinity as a Coxeter graph. Evident follow-up question uh, characterize abstractly the objects G that can occur as uh, standard invariants uh, for some factor, okay? And uh, of course, is this a complete invariant? Actually, I would even say that this was the initial question. Okay, you have the higher relative commitments immediately. It, well, is this a... And in fact, quite early on, I mean, Jones uh, Vaughan uh, uh, told me that he told me this observation in 87, but uh, he said that he had it for a few years. I said, you know, 86 like this, but I'm not sure exactly, probably earlier than that. He noticed probably very quickly that there exists many uh, uh, sub factors. You can take many uh, diagonal, so-called diagonal, locally trivial subfactors. I won't say what that is, but you know, many people in the audience will know what I'm talking about, which have the same standard invariant and never less because they come from group actions of non-amenable groups and you can have many of those on the hyperfinite one. So this is in the hyperfinite to one case. Well, then of course, the problem becoming then identify also the class of subfactors of the hyperfinite one for which it is a complete invariant. And of course, find all indices and objects, G graphs, bipartite graphs uh, uh, or of, uh, uh, corresponding to subfactors, irreducible preferably, uh, but you know, that is part of this data, the irreducibility, it shows up in the structure of the bipartite graph. Um, uh, of a given M constructed of certain data, okay? Notably for the hyperfinite one. Okay, so uh, this actually, I was able to uh, uh, prove to, to solve uh, uh, quite uh, quickly uh, the, the, some of these problems. Uh, uh, I'll start in not as necessarily chronological order. In any case, in 1990, I showed that for any uh, lambda minus one uh, larger than four, uh, there exists a factor, a subfactor that has lambda minus one uh, as index uh, and has um, a, a, a infinity graph. In other words, uh, the, the standard invariant consists of the Jones projections or only the algebras they, they generate, okay? Uh, okay, that amounts to having the relative high relative commutants generated by the Jones projections only. So you only have that and the structure of the diagrams, you know, so-called Bratelli diagrams of inclusions being already well understood, uh, the, the graph being A infinity, uh, uh, that, that's from one uh, initial uh, work in 81. Now, uh, the What's important about this is that this construction of N on, or into M that, that I uh, found uh, imposed itself deductively. Sort of it's by pure analysis, you know, uh, in the subfactor world, because you say, well, what if it's just the Jones projection? Okay, what would this lead me to? And of course you allow uh, so you take an N into M and assume that is what can happen wrong. And then, you know, you normally, because you do uh, try to exploit this relative commutants, okay? So you, you try to kill elements by unitaries. So randomness that comes naturally, okay? That randomness uh, procedures will come naturally, especially in N omega into M omega. So when you, uh, amplify this to, uh, you know, ultra powers so that to have more room for your analysis, okay? 
and and uh, that you know uh, randomness then uh, becomes more concrete because you find that you know pushing that to the extreme you will have free independence okay between the elements which naturally leads you to you know well you have this you know amalgamated free products and then you say well you know do they necessarily exist so and yes you can construct that separately here is you know this is you define the you know the, the amalgamated free product and do exactly you know the operations backwards and so you you do have and there is no contradiction whatsoever so i find that interesting okay because this really came from analysis okay so it's not like you know a revelation of a construction okay it's uh, it's it's important i think to emphasize that so now shortly after that let me in fact also answer the the you know the abstractization problem for the standard invariant of what exactly you need out of that plenty of information about the higher relative competence you know the, to minimize them okay and clearly emphasize what's needed in order for them to come from a subfactor okay so that's what i called as a as an abstract object, a standard lambda lattice, okay, that's basically a system of, uh, of uh, finite dimensional C-star algebras, uh, AIJ with inclusions, okay, with a copy of the Jones projection inside them, with a trace, and with some axioms. There are two main axioms, the so-called Jones-Markov axiom, which is about the traces and how they behave with respect to the Jones lambda projections, okay? And uh, a commutation axiom, which is between the algebras, which you can define, by the way, this, uh, this indices ij, you can take uh, with, with the i, uh, j is larger than i, and i just minus one and zero. And because of the axiom, you can, um, get all the AIJ from them. And then, you know, the axiom amounts to this commutation, the effect that for uh, when they are disjoint in terms of indices, okay, uh, they commute, okay? This is, looks like nothing, but it's very important and very strong, very uh, uh, hard to fulfill, okay? And I proved again that this is indeed a complete set of axioms. By this meaning what? That given any such object, there do exist subfactors with a parameter lambda minus one. Of course, lambda minus one is in the Jones spectrum. And uh, G, uh, I mean, the, the standard invariant of which is equal to G. The reconstruction is uh, exactly, you know, in that same spirit. Is this kind of randomness uh, construction, uh, randomizing the, the initial data with the G, okay? So it depends on an initial data, by the way, it's like imposing that in your subfactor, you have some algebra Q, and then from that you start constructing, okay? So I denote this, uh, it is a functorial you know, construction, and I call it n upper g depend of q into m upper g of q, okay, for obvious reason. It's, by the way, it is uh, functorial in all of them. So in both g in an appropriate sense for some sub lattices and in q. And in fact, with, the, with Dima, uh, a few years later, uh, we proved that if q is L of f infinity, uh, then these guys identify with the L of F infinity. Uh, again, this is the free group uh, factor with the, of the free group with infinitely many generators. Thus, given any lambda lattice that exists any to M of index lambda minus one, uh, such that the, the standard lattice is G and N is isomorphic to M is isomorphic to the free group factor. So this, by the way, using uh, free probability um, uh, theory uh, and you know models from uh, uh, Voiculescu's uh, a, a, a version 
of uh, of uh, 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 vehicular squirt random matrix uh, model. Uh, now the axiomatization of the standard lambda lattice makes this one that I explained to you, they, it makes them very versatile for reconstruction for purposes. Okay. Uh, uh, and in fact, the, the minimality of this, I mean, there are just very few, they look like nothing. Okay. The, when you just see them, okay. It's very little, okay. Information. I call it, let's call it frugality of conditions. This actually does lead also to some funny, you know, obstruction cut criteria for bipartite graphs. Actually, it's something that I explored at that moment because I was very excited and, you know, I, I tried to get some, also some combinatorial uh, conclusions out of these uh, consequences, which I could. Uh, but overall, the reality is that, you know, you can hardly work with these objects the way they are defined to investigate concrete examples, especially finite ones. Actually, I had in mind, especially, you know, the infinite graph. And by the way, when the graph is finite, it's what's called finite depth, okay? And that's like, you know, an, uh, by analogy with finite groups, I'll come to that, actually. Uh, and uh, in uh, actually in 1999 and onwards, uh, Jones, Vaughan Jones, uh, discovered the way to disca of describing this the standard invariant as a two-dimensional diamatic structure, so tangles, that's called planar algebra, uh, and which does provide a very powerful calculus tool for uh, carry on, uh, to carry on, uh, carry out computations for concrete such structures, allowing, for instance, to classify all standard invariants of subfactors of index less than five. You know, this is, you have to imagine this is like, you know, uh, classifying groups, but it's way more complicated, finite groups, I'm sorry, finite groups of not so large cardinality Okay, so this is, uh, it's, and it was a tremendous effort actually that lasted many uh, years. Uh, and he did that with, the, uh, I mean, it's actually, it's a whole group uh, that around one, uh, some of his students and young collaborators, which I will not get into that. Uh, now, viewing N into M, a subfactor, in other words, of finite index lambda minus one, a virtual lambda symmetry, you remember, okay, so as a bimodule uh, with of dimension lambda minus one, leads to interpreting also G as a two tensor category generated by H. What does this two stands for? Well, it's a tensor category with two units, okay, because you have your factor M, which let's say that's the main, but N can be, you know, it's a priori sort of as a completely different, okay? It may be isomorphic, but anyway, you think of it as an unknown, okay? It's just a, 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 a factor that's virtually isomorphic to M, okay? And that, but then you can, of course, once you have such a bimodule, you can take its adjoint and the whole, you know, this is the, the Kohn's philosophy of correspondences and Hilbert bimodule. You take the joint, you compose them, you tensor them, and, you know, you, you get a tensor, what has been called since then, you know, uh, and appearing in other subjects, in, other, uh, in algebra, etc., a two tensor category. I'm keeping the two because of the two units, okay, uh, generated by H and H bar. Um, uh, you know, generated under tensor product uh, fusion, a relative tensor product, the con tensor product, con fusion, uh, and uh, which uh, is a point of view, in fact, that Okneanu took already in 87, uh, 88, and um, uh, for, uh, 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 with, with a set of axiom, with a set of properties, and you know, interpreting all these high relative commutats as, as uh, ends and uh, uh, algebras between these uh, 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 bimodules. Uh, uh, that, of course, gives another way of looking. He emphasized it in the finite depth case, but, you know, once with my result in 94, 
uh, you know, that becomes uh, also a possible axiomatization of these objects in this manner, uh, where you, the nice thing being that the, the bipartite graph, then, you know, you can view the whole operation, you can view as a, uh, as a, a bit more complicated multiplication table because it involves two uh, units uh, and fusion or what's called fusion rules. Uh, and with the, now the graph being interpreted as a true Cayley graph of this, of the corresponding multiplication table, okay? With the generators, et cetera, and so on. Now I'll call it, I know, you know, that there, there is a long term which has been established, you know, because there are many young people who work phenomenally on, on these uh, objects from this perspective uh, to uh, a tensor, I know tensor category, there were two appears, C star appears and rigid. Now of all this, I hate the word rigid in this context, okay? And anyway, it takes almost one line, you know, to, to say the title of this object. So I'll just call them because they come from virtual symmetries. I'll call them virtual groups because that's what they are. So it's the virtual group generated by a virtual symmetry. Okay, so that's settled. Okay, the, I avoid the word quantized group because you know that means something else or quantum group also. The, it's the lambda that's quantized. This is really like a virtual group because of, you know, in any case, virtual symmetry is a very good term and I stick with it. So uh, now about uh, identifying the, uh, the standard invariants and the subfactors of the hyperfinite one uh, that uh, for which you, you can, uh, you know, for which the, the standard invariant is a complete invariant. So that, uh, led me uh, in the late uh, 80s and beginning of the 90s to um, formulate a, a notion of amenability uh, for the standard invariant for the graph, etc. Uh, uh, quite early, but it took some years to actually prove that this is indeed, uh, you know, uh, sufficient. Uh, so you you uh, you are tempted to put this but that was not at all clear that that's the proper notion because there are many others in fact around that you know were more appealing uh, so and this seems a bit too minimalistic namely just requiring this keston type condition by the way the index square no i'm sorry the square norm of the uh, graph is always less than the index uh, jones proved that it's equal when it's the gamma is finite uh, so, uh, and for certain examples uh, that come from group, this does amount to Keston's condition of amenability for the group, the acting group. Uh, so, you know, philosophically speaking, it's very, you know, tempting, okay? So we'll say exactly that, you know, the N into M has amenable standard invariant if you have that or amenable graph, a virtual lambda group, so abstractly will be amenable if its graph satisfies this condition, Keston type condition. And what is right away remarkable about this is that it is equivalent. This brings, you know, this very minimalistic condition to something with substance, okay? And that's a key Fermat type condition involving the weights of the graph, okay? Okay. So if you look at the graph bipartite, so you put it in, you know, two ways, you know, Coxeter type, whatever, but you organize it that way. And then, uh, okay, uh, the, you put the weights, which are the dimension of the Hilbert space, the square root of. So, uh, and, and so the, the Fulner condition uh, uh, is about, uh, you know, the bound, having sets that are almost invariant to the, to the graph uh, uh, edges, right? To the boundary over the graph edges with the weights, okay? Now, this is also equivalent as it happens to the co-amenability of the symmetric enveloping of inclusion of any subfactor with this uh, standard invariant. In fact, I listed here, uh, you know, it's really perhaps in this area of subfactor, you know, the result that I'm 
most proud of and it's pure analysis. And this, this is the list of, of things, you know, that come with amenability. First of all, the standard invariant is a complete invariant for hyperfinite subfactors with amenable graphs. So you're, you know, here it is. Uh, there is a hick though here, which I'll explain. Uh, also for any to M, the following are equivalent. Uh, first of all, M is, is isomorphic to R and the, the, the standard graph is amenable. Secondly, the symmetric enveloping to one uh, factor of N into M is amenable. I won't say what that is, okay? So it's a whole thing here, which I'm keeping out. And thirdly, there is this Eros lance type condition, uh, which in fact was the, <laughs> I mean, I had all these things, you know, up till I, until like 94, and I stayed for two more years for this damn result, which I wanted very much. And it was very hard to come because I did not know the proper proof of uh, the classic Efros lens. You know, I had other proofs which were not adaptable to this. And then I discovered one, which I thought was new even for them, uh, but in fact, it was uh, a proof that uh, I later found out that that Lance found. Uh, if, so when I found this proof, I saw that even in the Efros Lance case was a new proof, and it was it, you know like five lines. Uh, but the adaptation is still a bit non-trivial. And uh, certainly here, uh, n into m has amenable graphs. So this is only uh, about the graphs, amenability of graphs. Uh, then it contains a hyperfinite subfactor as a smooth commuting square embedding. I won't say what that is, but it's an extreme, like a, uh, uh, you, you can always then embed, uh, you know, the, the, your, um, uh, by number one here, your, your model Q into R, which has that invariant inside N into M in a sort of very fit way with all high relative commutants being identical even when you take the smaller ones in the Jones Tower, even when you take the small ones into the large ones. Uh, actually, I had this in, in early on for when you also assume uh, gamma uh, 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 strongly amenable, what's called, I mean, gamma to have um, ergodic, uh, to be ergodic. Uh, and it was recently that I extended this to the general case. Uh, there is here, I see, I'm a bit in uh, short of the time. So uh, uh, of all these things with amenability, by far, uh, I think this is in some sense, the previous page are all kind of results that you would expect, even if they are hard to get, okay? So you, you are not a posteriori necessarily surprised by them, although they were hard to come. Uh, but this is surprising, and it is a hereditary property of subfactor amenability. It says that if you have n into m, an inclusion of hyperfinite factors, say irreducible, you, you know, just so that I don't explain what extremality means, and which has amenable graph. So gamma, the no square norm of gamma is the index. If you have any inclusion of subfactors, that is embedded in here with commuting squares with no other condition, no extremality, no same index, so no uh, uh, like, like uh, um, so no, no condition except the commuting square condition, then Q into P follows amenable, okay? I mean, with the, the associated standard invariant amenable. Uh, so for instance, if you, if, uh, uh, this guy Q into P has a infinity graph, you cannot embed it into an amenable uh, uh, inclusion, okay? Now, uh, now, what about index rigidity? You remember the last problem was about, you know, uh, identifying the set of uh, the values of the index and in general, all these structures, the virtual group, the, the uh, standard invariant, uh, the standard graph, uh, the, the values of the index of the parameter lambda minus one in specific uh, classes of subfactors, uh, you know, coming especially from geometric objects. Okay, so forget the randomness one, which we saw, you know, can give you anything. 
Well, I'll say that the Tuan factor M has the UV. So there is actually a, a striking result that came from the formation rigidity theory. And I wanted to you know, kind of briefly explain some hints of that. So uh, the, roughly speaking, OK, let me go directly to the theorem, in fact, because of the time uh, issue. Uh, so the theorem says that uh, given any free group and any free ergodic measure preserving action of a free group on the probability measure space, OK, this resulting to one factor has the property that all of its uh, subfactors uh, have integer index, OK? And in fact, group-like standard invariant, OK? In fact, you can describe them as, you know, this kind of C0, C plus, and and uh, uh, C minus and, uh, and C plus uh, uh, type of uh, uh, structures of, of uh, standard invariants, which are very geometric. So st standard invariant is actually, you can even say more, the, the weights, um, uh, the, the weights are, are uh, squares of integers. So in other words, the MM modules are all have uh, in square integers. <laughs> so, okay, the subfactors have integer values, but the mm by module have square, uh, uh, n square, you know, so. And that's actually true for la much larger classes of uh, group actions. Uh, the above actually should hold true uh, for many more group measure spaces. So this is quite a striking, you know, rig index rigidity which comes from the geometric background of these two one factors. This, I find this absolutely fascinating, you know, compared to the randomness situation. Okay, and now we'll get, you know, at some point with the hyperfinite one, you know, this whole picture to me is just amazing. Okay, and I, you know, uh, I, I have no words, you know, about, you know, the, I still believe, you know, it's the, just the tip of the iceberg. So uh, it has been conjectured that, in fact, for all groups uh, that have uh, uh, some L2 beta number non-zero, uh, they are what's called Cartan, strongly Cartan rigid, meaning that you have this UVC property for their Cartan subalgebras, this uniqueness up to unitary conjugacy, uh, even for, for Cartan, first of all, but even for virtual cartons, so the ones that normalizer is, has finite index in the big factor. Uh, so for all of these, it should be true that any free ergodic PMP action, uh, gamma on X, uh, you know, you have uh, this uh, rigidity uh, deep from the previous page with the square, this, let's call it strong rigidity of strong, uh, rigidity of the, um, uh, you know, the symmetry structure. Uh, in fact, you have more than that because it's not only st sticking with the Betty numbers thing. It's really, you know, for probably uh, for lots of group actions also uh, of any non-aminable group. For instance, any non-aminable group acting by Bernoulli shifts or even perhaps even all mixing actions should entail such a rigid you know, uh, such a rigidity, uh, which is actually from the point of view of the formation rigidity theory, this is not far-fetched, but the consequence is amazing for the symmetry rigidity, okay? Uh, okay, so I pointed out here this funny observation that you can realize a two-one factor with Cartan subalgebra, unique, so it has this, this strong rigidity property. It comes from an action of the free group uh, F infinity uh, or profinite action, free ergodic profinite action. So it fits in this picture of you know, strong rigidity of the symmetries. But you can view it because it's a profinite, uh, come from profinite action as an inductive limit of amplifications of L of F infinity, which are all by integers which by uh, Voiculescu's amplification formula is equal to L of F infinity. So you, you have a tower of finite index inclusion with trivial relative commutants of copies of L of F infinity. Each step you have complete 
freedom of you know all symmetries in the world can act at the end there is nothing left there is nothing that keeps uh, you know the symmetries of the resulting inductive limit is none i mean you have no symmetries there but these very rigid ones this i, I find this very funny and here is my last page oh god it's 55 where Arthur said that I should kind of stop. Uh, so these are some problems. There are some. No, you go on. See, yeah. Well, I I'll go for this page. This is my last page anyway. So let's denote by I of n the set of all indices of irreducible subfactors of finite index of the two one factor n. It's a notation of Jones from his ICM talk in eighty six. And uh, let's also denote this way by E, the set of square norms of bipartite graphs. Uh, so this is a closed set because I allow you know, infinite bipartite graphs. Uh, it's known to be, uh, to have a, uh, this half line in it, okay? Square root of uh, five plus two to infinity, but it's known to only have an increasing sequence of accumulation points which with the first one, the smallest one being four, which is the limit of four cosine square of pi over n, so the Jones spectrum, and then a sequence of accumulation points with each one of them having the specificity that it's an accumulation from both below and above, uh, and uh, that's it, okay? So this is the set, okay? Uh, the, and the index rigidity conjectures, I call them, are, Okay, that for the hyperfinite one, the set of irreducible uh, indices is exactly uh, this set of square norms of graphs. So there are two major problems here, but we won't have time, you know, to, to dissect that. And that if M has a Cartan decomposition, any Cartan, then the, the any index has, I mean, irreducible has um, a value, uh, you know, a square norm of a, of a bipartite graph. Uh, and there are more problems. Of course, the first one is, you know, the major problem in subfactor theory, characterize all virtual lambda groups that can act on R. So you see, this is why I like virtual group. And I put lambda to emphasize the quanta, the, the quantum, you know, the, the Jones quantization phenomenon, okay? That's the reason I put the parameter, okay? And, but the, the word group, it's impossible not to have, you know, I'm sorry for this, you know, the, of course, you know, it's a tensor category, blah, blah, but, you know, you, to avoid, you know, that it's a group kind of object, I, I think it's a pity. And you cannot say, you know, that the planar algebra acts or, or like the a lambda lattice acts on something or, well, it's a bit more conceivable for a tensor, but even that, you know, but the virtual group acts. Okay, so that's why I, kind of, you know, as writing this, you know, getting back to subfactor things, um, uh, I, this came to my mind, this terminology. So is any lambda minus one uh, in IR a TLJ point? By that, uh, this TLJ st stands for temporally leap joints. So meaning that there exists necessarily a subfactor uh, with the standard invariant equal to G lambda, okay? This, I think it's a beautiful problem. And of course, the converse kind of, you know, the theorem from previous page, this is known for groups. When a group is non-amenable, then you have lots of non-conjugate, non-cosecular conjugate actions on the hyperfinite one. And this is the analog of that. If G is non-amenable uh, and can act on R, so you, you take a G that fits into number one here, okay, then there exist many non-conjugate uh, subfactors of R with the same value. Okay, and, and I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soren, for very interesting, uh, well, a picture, a beautiful picture of what's known about this subject. It's amazing the number of technical things you've discovered. I'd like to open up the floor for questions and uh, hopefully there are many May I ask a question? Yes, Roberto. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Hi. Hi. 
concerning yes. your 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 problem uh, of which uh, virtual uh, group on air. I, yes. If I remember correctly, there was a paper by Yamagami about action of tensor categories, and uh, I wonder what is missing. What do you mean? Uh, there was, if I remember correctly, Yamagami showed that all tensor categories of a certain kind act on R. No, 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 this, there is a confusion. This is completely open. This is the most major problem. You know, you don't know what uh, the, uh, 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 these objects come with the parameters. So with an index answering this would mean, you know, that you know what uh, are all sub indices of subfactor of uh, irreducible subfactors of the hyperfinite one. It's probably a confusion. So that, that if I remember, it's a, it's a triviality, that paper of, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, but I, I think it's it's just uh, it's it's a um, you know it's a it's a reformulation of um, of my uh, reconstruction uh, you know method, not on the hyperfinite one. Okay. The only Yamagami. All all those papers are you know reformulations in a different language of of my reconstruction result. Okay. What if you add the finite uh, test to, to the questions? Well, the, the finite depth it has intrinsically, uh, you know, the model, so they all act on the hyperfinite one. This is why Oknano didn't uh, need uh, this, uh, you know, the, the whole, uh, at that stage, you know, the moment you imposed that that uh, the standard uh, invariant is finite, I mean, you know, the graph is finite, so finite depth, uh, the, the, the model for a, a subfactor, it's intrinsic, right? It, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, the commuting, the, the old, the initial Jones uh, uh, construction of a commuting square of finite dimensional algebras that you iterate and you, you obtain the model. So th that's oh, there. You, you have no issue about, you know, this kind of so-called reconstruction issue. The, the model contains the, uh, you know, already the, the hyperfinite one factor sort of intrinsically in, in it. No, no, but the, my question is, what is the set of indices of uh, irreducible subfactors of the Well, of course, that's a, you see, this, this enters into one. what I call, thank you for asking actually, so the you see the you you saw the title of my of my talk is is analysis aspects. So even though there are these problems which uh, you know give uh, I mean they, they are also at the boundary line you know between of course there is there should be analysis because it's about things acting on the on one factors but there is also clearly, you know, you need to cope with, with the, you know, combinatorial and uh, issues and algebra, etc. cetera. Uh, but the, there is uh, uh, a, a problem which is really kind of purely combinatorial in nature, uh, algebraic in nature, and that's, you know, to investigate what are all the these abstract objects forget about okay the two one factors they may act on okay just look at the at the at these virtual groups and understand them classify them so your question is in fact what are all the finite virtual groups well as you so you know even uh, you know, with the planar algebra formalis, which is extremely powerful for this particular, so uh, really Vaughan, um, you know, he, his uh, purpose was to analyze exactly, you know, to give an answer to your question, you know, and uh, really clearly provide the machinery that can say, you know, give me this, uh, you know, graphs, bipartite graph, finite bipartite graph, or this, you know, uh, finite and, and the possible finite structure, which comes usually as a commuting square of, of algebras, 
is this standard, okay? So does, is there a sub-factor behind that gives you this? Uh, so that's your question. And this is, of course, extremely hard. It's like you ask me, you know, of this new, completely new world of objects, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, you, you know, how it would took decades to classify all simple finite groups. I mean, here, you know, it, it only went to index five to classify this, uh, the, the, the index less than five uh, finite depth, uh, uh, you know, um, virtual group. So I'm sorry, I'm, I will keep saying virtual group because I kind of like it, especially because you see the, the four symmetries, virtual symmetry is very well defended, okay? Virtual isomorphism, virtual symmetry, this is clear. To me, this, there is no question, you know, this are, is a perfect, well, perfect terminology. Okay, well then, well, if one accepts that, then the group it gen group like, you know, I think it generates by via multiplications, adjoints, etc. Well, it's a virtual group to me. Okay. So uh, I, I think I, I, I think this is really, you know, in the end, a good word. When you want to, by the way, like with many objects in mathematics, you know, when Alain Kohn in 1980, you know, proposed the representation theory for one factors as coming, you know, from Hilbert by modules. He called them correspondences, uh, but the idea behind was that in fact, it's a multifaceted object. So it, you can view it as an endomorphism. You can view it as a Hilbert by module. You can view it as a rep of M tensor uh, N uh, op. Uh, uh, okay, you can, uh, so it's all that, okay? Well, it's the same here. So, but each one or uh, as a, as a uh, completely uh, positive uh, map, okay? So it's amazing. And viewing it in either way, okay, focuses on a different angle, a different, it sets your mind in a different way and it's advantageous, you know, to have this, of course. It's like the GNS construction, you know, that you, we know that, you know, how we play between, you know, with the GNS from, you know, after all, you just take a function. Why, you know, we call it a rep, but it's, it's in fact a phi. It's just a, you know, a positive definite function, uh, a, a, a positive function, a state. A state is a rep, okay? So it's this kind of multi, facet angles and I, but when you say that something like this acts on a one factor, okay, can act, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the group like object uh, generated by a, a virtual symmetry, uh, okay, I think it's nice virtual group, virtual lambda group. Uh, one should keep in mind though that it's a two point unit, okay, group. So I see that uh, Chengwei, you've been unmuted for a long time. Did you have some question? Uh, yes. Uh, for say for non-amenable lambda group acting on two one factor. Yes. Uh, what could be the environment to distinguish different actions? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a, a, a fantastic question. I have no idea. I mean, I have no um, how to say uh, you know uh, uh, propose. I mean, I have no uh, candidate. For that, that would be great. You see, there is one example, of course. That's, I mean, the way we one kind of did this. For instance, Dietmar and I, in a paper, we we did show that there are, you know, for index six and for irreducible, but they are group-like. We cheated, of course, grossly, uh, and, and there it's immediately you bring the problem to groups and etc. Uh, so it, it's not a, a good answer, of course. I mean, you answer the problem, and so. You know, because it, it opens up the perspective of probably showing that for any uh, non-amenable you have many actions. But yeah, so the the it's clear that the key example to treat and and look at, and this is very concrete, is the free product between a three and a four. I mean the 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 hyperfinite subfactor that that you obtain by composing uh, you know freely the which which is less than uh, six is it less than five it's uh, five. 
Yes. So, uh, so it's actually, so it's pretty small. And, and uh, that, that, that's really something that would be great to be able to prove. Uh, but we have no tools. You see, the, in the formation rigidity, one of the problems is uh, to deal uh, precisely with this, you see, this what's uh, fantastic. I mean, in uh, in the formation rigidity, often really use, uh, you know, uh, they, they, uh, the moving things around. Um, it's really uh, for especially for torsion-free situations. Okay, so the moment we get into this issue, you know, with the virtual isomorphism, we just say we put it under the carpet and say they are virtually isomorphic. So which, you know, in fact, when you look under the carpet, you know, it's a lot of trash there. <laughs> so that you hide under this word, okay? So uh, when you see a result, you know, any rigidity result up to virtual stuff, it means that, you know, over there, it's a lot of, you know, actually non-said uh, that, you know, so, but you cannot obtain better. You see that that's really, you know, the nature of those results. So, however, when you have some sort of torsion freeness, things are very beautiful, okay? It's really completely fixed, you know, things, you know, can be moved around. And, and we don't, it's the, the, the difference between dealing with normalizers of algebras versus quasi-normalizers. So uh, this kind of uniqueness and, and um, rigidity things often could be proved for normalizers because you double things and you don't know to how to double quasi-isomorphism. I mean, this kind of virtual isomorphism that not suitable to that. A and um, so that's why in, in, in a way, some sort of philosophical explanation why you cannot put this uh, you know, uh, index two times index uh, two plus, um, how is it? Uh, what's the actual value? It's uh, two plus. Five over two. Yes, three plus over, over, two, over two, exactly. Thank you. It's, it's 5.2 something. And by the way, the classification is known up to 5.25, which is uh, 5 slightly, which is slightly yes. above two plus square root of five. Not right, I should and have so, said and, and so, in fact, all the subfactors uh, with index two plus square root of five are known. Uh, and so there is the A3 and A4 free composition, as you mentioned. But then yes. there are some other ones as well, some finer depth yes. ones. And, and of course, you know, uh, what's also been shown is that um, subfactors with uh, infinite standard graph and principal graph between four and uh, two plus square root of five are all finite depths or A infinity. Right. So there's no, so it's, it, it, it's not just classification of uh, finite depth subfactors in the index range, but um, also all the right. standard invariants for within right. are yeah. known as well. And, yeah, and, and the first non-trivial one is the A3 free product A4, which is at, uh, yes. well, about four, right? Which is at index 5.2 something. Uh, which, yes, uh, you know, but less four. than 5.25. Right. Yes, I should put the 5.25, you're right. Thank yeah, you. and, and that, that, that is actually sort of a, it's kind of a non-trivial um, thing to go above two plus square root of five. You know, although the difference between two plus square root of five and 5.25 is small. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, that, Here that, it's, a, it's a huge, uh, I mean, every uh, little, pro I mean, little, every epsilon progress on that line, it's a, a huge amount of work. I mean, you know, these are extremely hard uh, uh, papers and and things you know with lots of uh, of things that that have been developed and and tools and so on in in the planar algebra framework thank you so george you're unmuted did you have a question well well i i i i have a very elementary question um uh, which, which which you may already have uh, well which quite possibly you've already answered them um, when you say conjugate do you mean by an inner automorphism or by an arbitrary automorphism, or is it the same it's thing? Here, here in this context, thank you for asking. Actually, in this context, it's it's up to a conjugation by an automorphism of M. So really, you all the talk here is about N one into M one being isomorphic to N two into M two, meaning there exists an isomorphism of M one onto M two 
that carries N1 onto N2. So it's okay, really up to uh, conjugacy by isomorphism and, and by, it's a good, especially because we now have lots of inner conjugacy. What happens for inner conjugacy is that has been answered. It's a, a result of uh, Adrian, Jesse, and myself. Also, in fact, uh, 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 Stefan uh, has uh, given uh, a proof of this uh, as well. Uh, and that is this kind of freeness in, uh, in the hyperfinite one. So in the hyperfinite one factor, the following is true. You have uh, any, any uh, given any, um, uh, any countably uh, many, uh, any countably many uh, uh, indices, uh, uh, say uh, uh, finite index subfactors uh, with same same standard invariance, same you know same data completely you know same invariance. Uh, there exists another one. So given any countable, there exists another one that's not unitary conjugate to any of these. Oh, sure. oh. And therefore, there exists uncountably many uh, well. non-inner conjugate in the hyperfinite one for any given any factor, subfactor, there exists uncountably many non-inner yeah. conjugate. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. So Minchul, do you have a comment? We don't hear your audio. Oh, sorry, mistake. So is there any other understanding of a correspondence between the known examples and examples from physics? Uh, the, well, the examples from physics, as I'm a bit you know, weak on this side, uh, <laughs> but uh, there is Di Evans and, and of course Dietmar, of course also, uh, here that that probably you know who, who know this uh, much better i mean Dai was in any case up to a point i don't know if he's still around Dai evans uh, he switched off i think uh, he has a he has a seminar too uh, he has his own seminar because he, he's uh, do, do, do you have a comment you're what, 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 what what exactly is your question the relation between known examples and problems from physics. Is there anything known? Well, I mean, a lot is known, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, there's obviously uh, the whole connection to statistical mechanical models and, yes. uh, uh, but I mean, you know, the big question that, that Vaughan was interested in is, um, the, the representations of the Virasoro algebra, and there you have this, this similar uh, phenomenon of uh, continuous spectrum and discrete spectrum, right? Uh, uh, for the parameter that describes the, the reps of the, the Virasoro algebra. And, and there, I think, a direct uh, connection between that phenomenon and, and uh, the discreteness and the continuity of the Jones set of indices, I don't think that's known. Yes, but probably uh, Arthur was uh, thinking also at this, uh, you know, more concrete things of, you know, subfactors in sort of uh, 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 quantum uh, mechanics relevant, relevant for physics. I mean, in, in a sort of, but that, that's probably what Dai and Ga uh, Evans and Gannon are doing and all that stuff and all, all the, the things that uh, that Vaughan did also right. the so, component so right. the factors, the, the Fink and, and Roberto. Uh, I mean, there, you know, there is, of course, there is the, the world of uh, quantum groups at roots of unity and, and um, all those categories, you know, that they also appear as categories in subfactor theory and they are of course physics related, right? I mean, 
solutions yes. of the quantum young baxter equation and, yes, and, and the rational, yes. rational conformal filters right uh, yeah. but i mean you know the the big question is um and, and that's what Vaughan has been talking about in the last few years is you know can you take um, let's say a finite uh, depth subfactor and build a conformal field theory from it, right? Yeah. And so, so for instance, um, you know that question arose with the Haar group subfactor, yes. and, and uh, you know Gannon and uh, and uh, Di Evans they have been working on that, and and uh, there is the, the the modular data and so on. You know that that all seems to be there. It's just that nobody has been able to actually construct primary fields yet. Um, but you know the, uh, I mean the, the Italian group. Sebastiano is on the call. He can probably say more about that. Uh, there is you know this this whole way of cons constructing conformal nets, right? And so so that yes. part of the story is actually known. Right? So maybe Sebastian Sebastiano or Gandalf or even Klaus Friedenhagen has some comments. So. <laughs> Can you, okay, can you see me? No, yes, uh, this is a big problem, but uh, so it, it's a beautiful problem. So I don't know if it's really a problem about subfactors or about uh, tensor categories. And of course, <clears throat> it's not really. So the problem was you take the, so a subfactor and you take the, the quantum double, because then you get something braided and you, you ask for a quantum field theory. So, there are many, many ways. Of course, there are many examples, so you can check what you find. But for example, something like Agarup is not, uh, has not been found. I know that there is some work also about lattice model and more close to physics in order to try to realize that kind of. I think there is some progress, but I'm not really up, up to date about this. And, uh, okay, so. <laughs> So I guess the answer is, you know, there are still a lot of people are working on those questions, and 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 you know, I mean, the, the big hope is that uh, we will indeed be able to uh, construct new conformal field theories from a subfactor, and um, you know, there, there has been some evidence that that might be the case. At least the, the sort of combinatorics that has been computed from subfactors all fits, right? It's just the uh, the, the analysis part uh, is, is missing, right? So the construction of the primary fields, you know. Right. No, has any idea how to do that? Yes, but I don't know even for statistical mechanics, discrete models, if there is still, uh, so if you have examples, because there are two steps. So, so maybe you can find something discrete from physics, and then you try to, to find the conformal field theory as some scaling limit or renormalization group or something like this. That's, uh, I don't know even if the first step is still complete. I think that there is some progress on this for other I've seen recent papers, but I'm not sure about this. In any case of... Uh... Can I... Um, if you uh, consider you have answered uh, Arthur's, uh, I mean, commented on, on that, I, I, I would take, you know, permission to... <laughs> To say a couple more words, you know, I, I'm a bit puzzled because it, it's like Ro, uh, Roberto's question earlier, and in fact, as it happens, um, also one of my former students who, who should, in fact, be quite aware of these problems, uh, you know, asked me. So I, I think there is, uh, you know, and this is very unfortunate, lots of confusion. So, for instance, uh, my former students, you know, on the basis of uh, the, um, of that uh, paper of uh, Vaughan and you know in the in the bulletin the long uh, 50 40 50 page long uh, expository paper about this amazing work you know on, on uh, that essentially Digma described you know on, or with the, the list of all uh, standard invariants of all these objects of all this the planar algebras up to index five. Uh, the that that um, that can occur, uh, okay. That that gave the impression that you know. So as I said, you know, my former student who initially was working in something. I don't want to shame him to say his name. Uh, said well, but this is known, you know, that all indices of subfactors of the hyperfinite one. Uh, so you see, it's because so I. 
I don't think it's a good idea to use the word subfactor, okay, for this, for the planar algebras and at all. Uh, so this looked like some defendable 20, 25 years ago, but nowadays it creates lots of confusion. So it really needs to be emphasized that these are, you know, some sort of groups, okay, so virtual groups, why not? Lambda lattices, planar algebras, you know, tensor categories, and you want to classify them. That's one problem, okay? Especially when they are finite. It's an amazing problem, very interesting. Now, when you say subfactor, it means you it acts on some specific body, okay, on a specific to one factor. And when that to one factor, and, and you saw how amazingly complicated that problem is, okay? Depending on the geometric data, on the building data of that one factor, this problem is extremely hard and very subtle, okay? It has lots of answers, okay? Well, when it is the hyperfinite one, okay, this is completely kind of unknown, okay? Beyond four, okay? So I view this as a, you know, fields meta level problem, okay? which has not been solved by Amagami in, in the 90s, okay? So it's, you know, whatever, you know, breaks to price, you know, it's, you know, right there, you know, with the free group factor problem, with the constant bedding problem, it's, it's an extremely hard and amazing problem, okay? It's an extraordinary problem, very hard analysis problem, of course, and it has two, two aspects to it, because you saw that conjecture, it has two inclusions. First, you want to prove the obstruction thing and then to solve what's called the commuting square problem. For the first two, three things, you know, Ufe using his mental power, but also lots of computing power, okay, solve that for a few graphs, which give you uh, you know, actually as a standard thing, so the commuting square problem, but which constructs subfactors which have an infinity graph, you know, with the eight, E10, for instance, subfactor. Uh, so, you know, well, th these are, it's, so to prove that for all bipartite graphs is quite something. I mean, all those values. Uh, and uh, so that's something I actually worked on in the 90s quite a, a, a lot. That was actually, you know, main focus early on, 80s, but I'm sorry, 80s, back in, in Romania, especially the this co commuting square problem, but to, to have a, a, a general analysis answer to it, you know, by, you know, uh, constructing, you know, inductive limits with almost commuting squares and, but somehow, you know, getting, it, it's very hard. So the other inclusion, okay, that, you know, all these uh, square norms can be realized. Uh, so it's two, two inclusions and which are very hard, okay. So I the, yeah. sorry. No, sorry. And, and I think the part that's really confusing to non-experts is that when you construct uh, hyperfinite subfactors using the commuting square methods, then you know the graphs that are involved in the commuting square have nothing to do with the standard graphs, right? Exactly. And so, so whenever, whenever I talk, you know, to non-experts, the, the, so that which is why I like the adjective standard. Okay, so for uh, this bipartite graphs, the the spectrum which I told you, I draw. I mean, I showed you know the, how they go. I mean, I describe them by uh, orally. Uh, the with the six word, then two ply square root of five to infinity. So they 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 uh, most of them you can very. <laughs> you can wipe out lots of them of from being standard. Standard means that it's self-reproducing, okay? This is one way to think of them. They are bipartite graphs which somehow have ingrained in them the possibility of, you know, uh, uh, self-reproducing in the subfactor sense. So this kind of say you have solved this commuting square problem, like Dietmar said, then, but then, you know, when you recapture from that picture, the high relative commutant, it's like self, like reproducing the gamma, which is this commutation relation 
at least in my language of lambda lattices, uh, you know, which makes it self-reproducing. Okay, so you recover it. Okay, from the the uh, finalized subfactor that you construct from the inductive limit of commuting squares. Well, sorry. <laughs> well, I think we want to thank you again, Soren, for an absolutely beautiful discussion and opening up a whole set of unanswered questions. That's very inspiring. So we have something to work on over a long period of time. And we'll come back here again next week with a switch to physics because we have Misha Lukin, completely different talk. But I hope you will all come back and bye bye. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.